Hello and welcome to this tutorial where I'm going to have a look at game boundaries in Crater. When I say the words game boundaries, what I'm specifically talking about is how we manage the design and the aesthetics of the very edge of the playable spaces in our games. So how do we make sure that it looks cool um, but it's also functional? It's also making sure players aren't running off the edge of the world or are running off the edge of the world or however you want to manage it. And the cool thing about this challenge is there's no correct answer. There's lots of different solutions to this problem. It's a creative and technical problem. Uh, and so it's really up to you how you want to go about doing this. Uh, and it might be different for different games, different mechanics, different themes. It all depends on what kind of game you're making. Uh, so with that said, I've, I've built a showcase of a few options that might help you if you're getting really stuck on how to approach game boundaries. But I think it'd be really cool is if you also, if you come up with a novel solution or an innovative way of doing this, make sure that you share that. Take screenshots and post them on the Discord, discord.gg forward slash crater, or alternatively, write about them in the comments below and just talk about how you approached the edges of your game world and hopefully we can all learn from each other about some interesting and cool ways to, to, to solve this problem. So here are some possible solutions that I have used in games before uh, and so far haven't had any negative feedback. <laughs> we'll see. Um, the first one is the classic wall. Now if you uh, make a game in Crater and it's your if, if you want to make your first game and you want to make it an acceptable game boundary, this is the most simple and direct approach is to make your game take place indoors and have a wall and a ceiling and call it done and not worry about boundaries much more than that. A wall tells your player it signifies that you cannot walk through this. In fact, if I ran up to a wall and passed through it, I would question what's going on and that would surprise me. Narratively, that might make sense in your game, but it might surprise players if you can walk through walls. So the wall is telling me this is the end of the game world and I probably won't even try and walk into it. Uh, and that's how effective a boundary that is. The only problem, the only downside to walls is they are very two-dimensional flat planes and they don't tell me much more about the world I'm in. So perfect for uh, some games but some games if you're trying to build a universe or tell a story through the landscape of your world a wall won't add anything to that it won't be you won't be able to bring more narrative into your game and it can also make your game feel slightly less immersive um, just because you don't feel like you're part of this bigger thing so you're very aware that you're playing a game uh, and that leads me nicely on to semi-transparent walls or walls with holes in. Um, so walls with holes in allow you to do two things. They take the best parts of the fact that a wall is telling a player that they can't walk through it. And they also allow you to build out a world beyond that wall. Tell your player a story that uh, exists beyond the game space they're in. So make them feel like they're part of something much grander, uh, an entire universe. And it doesn't actually take that much to just add a couple of, you know, a couple of windows into a wall or, or make it into battlements or however you want to approach this. Uh, make it thick enough so that when you run up to the edge of the wall, you can't necessarily look down and expect to see grass. And then I'm just going to hop into my drone here. I've literally just used one tree. Uh, and that tells my players a story. If I go now and look through this window as a player and I see, let's look through this window here where I can see my tree. I can see the tree, but what's cool is I can see the top of my tree, right? So that tells me as a player that where I am is high up. I'm at the top of tree level. So maybe first or second story of some kind of building. Um, and then beyond that, I can see the mountains. Now, the mountains I haven't built myself. If I enter advanced mode, I can show you how I've generated those mountains um, in the horizon. If you go to the world tab in advanced mode and scroll down to sky elements, within there we have horizon. And this will add a vista 
360 degrees around your game space. You can choose in this drop down between whatever kind of outer horizon you want, whether it's an alien planet or a desert or indeed mountains. And we also have this inner horizon. If I um, turn off the, the fog, we have this inner horizon. So this is the kind of the ground that leads all the way up to our game space. And you can have, again, desert or mountains or however you want to do that. Uh, and now when I look through the window, I've got this sort of, I've got a tree and I've got mountains and it feels like there's a world beyond where I'm at. Even if it's not a fully fleshed out world and it's just got a tree in it, that tells me this is a lush green land that I'm in. Uh, you know, so that's already telling me, all right, so someone's looking after it or nature is still a thing in this place. If it was space outside that window or if it was a very urbanized environment, then it would tell me a completely different story. So narrative is really important. As soon as you open up the, the beyond the boundary of your game, beyond the wall, if you like, then narrative comes into play and theming and suggesting to your player, yeah, what else is going on in this story? So now that I've talked about walls, I'm going to start looking at some alternative ways to approach game boundaries in your creations in Crater. So over here, I've created a, uh, a very sports themed game space. Um, so this is, yeah, I don't know what sport this is. Yeah, made it up. It's a new sport. Uh, but what I have got is I've got this white line around the edge. And this is the court, if you like. And then I can actually go past that. So I can be out. Maybe that's a thing in my game. Maybe it's not. Or the ball could be out or whatever. And then I've got this red line. And the, along the red line, I've positioned an invisible wall. So if let's go into advanced mode quickly, I'll show you how I've done that. So if I click on this and go to my invisible invisible wall, wherever that is. Ah, I was looking at that one. Uh, there. Um, so this is a voxel mesh. It's an independent voxel mesh. And you can see that here. Uh, and all I've done is I've drawn a wall in rock <laughs> around my game world, positioned it exactly on that red line. And then just clicked the visible checkbox to make it invisible. So notice that when it's invisible, it's still collidable and that goes uh, that is true for me as a player true for the other players and would be true for any balls or other physical objects depending on how i set the collision overlap and you can change the collision overlap let me just show you how to do that quickly invisible wall so that's my invisible wall i've got selected um i can uh change whether things are coll collidable here with this collision enabled so uh, let's make that invisible again. So I've made an invisible wall. Uh, an important thing about an invisible wall is it needs some kind of signifier, um, I think. It, it's really helpful for players to have a signifier that that is going to be where an invisible wall is and keep that consistent throughout your game so that they're not constantly running into invisible walls and getting frustrated because there shouldn't be uh, an impassable object there, you know? Um, so if you just draw on the ground where that wall is, that can add a lot. It can tell your player, hey, this is the edge of the game space in a quite unobtrusive kind of way. Um, and people, you know, they might, it might break immersion a little bit, but it's better that you're not surprising your player um, and like telling them that this is the edge of the game space. Uh, it, it just, um, it just means that it, they won't get necessarily frustrated with running into an invisible wall. An invisible wall will mean that you need to dress beyond the wall. You will need some kind of what it, what is beyond that wall. Now here I've just, uh, if we again just focus on this direction for the horizon, uh, I've just added a little bit of what might be around a sports arena. And normally I would build this all the way around this, but for the purposes of this tutorial, I've just built it at one end to show you that I can I can still tell a little bit of a story beyond this invisible wall. But what's quite cool with an invisible wall is you don't necessarily need to tell the whole story. Like I'm never going to end up behind here because I can't escape from my my um, play area here. So I, I don't have to spend loads and loads of time uh, in, on things that aren't going to be visible to the player. I just need to dress it enough to tell the story 
uh, and that's enough. So invisible walls can work. They're quite a quick and cheap way of doing it, uh, of creating a game boundary, um, but worth bearing in mind that there's a way of signifying to your player uh, that there's a wall there. And uh, and it's really perfect for prototyping as well. So, uh, because yeah, uh, you don't have to spend loads and loads of time doing things. <laughs> uh, okay, so we've talked about walls and we've talked about invisible walls, ways to stop players uh, from overstepping the boundary. Let's now look at some of the, f the effects outside of that boundary. So, Let's go over to the beach here. And at the beach, uh, this needs, this is a, something I see quite a lot of in Crater is the terrain is extended as far as the eye can see. Um, and so let me just make it as far as the eye can see by using fog. So I'm in advanced mode, go to the world tab. And if I scroll down in here, I find this fog section Let's just increase that fog density a little bit. And what we're trying to do is make sure that we can't see the edge of this terrain here. I'm aware it's water, but for the purposes of this tutorial, I'm just going to call it terrain because it could be any kind of terrain, water, mountain, whatever. Um, so we've got fog start, fog density and fog fall off, as well as choosing the fog color and whether it's affected by the atmosphere, which is to do with the light coming from the sun. Um, so the fog start is how close to the camera this fog is uh, starts. Uh, fog density is how thick the fog is and fog fall off is how high the fog is. So you can use this really nicely. I've seen this um, used really nicely in, uh, I think it was called Neon Symphony. Um, which was a game where the creator, which was Mochi, had basically used the fog to make it feel like there was an there was no end to their game world by blending it into the night. So there's some cool things you can do with fog um, to essentially stop players from being able to see the edge of your horizon, and then you just make the horizon the, the as far as you can see from maybe the furthest point in your game. So, for example, here, if we are only looking in this direction, again, ignore the side um, the side of the peripheral there. You can see, ah, I can't see the edge of it. And I could put something like an invisible wall here to stop the player from running off the edge of the beach. Um, they might not expect it initially, but um, by having this water here and by having the invisible wall, you're essentially saying, hey, water is impassable to your character in this game world. Um, and so it wouldn't be the end. Uh, it wouldn't be disastrous to do that now. Uh, one thing to bear in mind when you're doing this kind of uh, using this approach to soften the edges of your game world is let's go up to an elevated position by standing on top of this lifeguard hut and immediately I can see the edge of the game world. So down the bottom there when I was at uh, sea level oh it's it's looking mysterious and I can't see the edge but as soon as I'm in an elevated position I can once again see the game world. So something to bear in mind it, when you're using this approach is, hmm, how high can my player go in my game world? If they're, you know, using jump pads to soar through the sky or jetpacks or um, or hot air balloons or whatever it is, um, they will be able to see the edges of the game world really, really easily um, if they're really high up. Even just a slight increase in altitude like this I can see very clearly there's the edge of the game world and immediately my immersion is broken. And um, I, I, yeah, it, it's just worth bearing in mind how high can I go? How far can I see? Um, and maybe this isn't the correct approach for every single game. And if you want water to be passable in your game, you want to allow players to swim in your game um, like this. Just bear in mind that by stopping them from swimming in some water, and allowing it in other waters, uh, it's, it could be a bit surprising for your uh, your adventurers to to experience that, um, and it, it might not feel very very good, very immersive. So bear in mind that that kind of uh, that kind of approach has got limitations, and hopefully, it's still a legitimate approach. It's still there's still value in it as an approach. But it, I, I would suggest that you consider whether it is the right approach for your game, just extending off into the fog. Um, 
so that's us talking about the fog and uh, uh, extending the horizon into the distance. Now let's talk about one of my favorite approaches to, um, to game boundaries. And this is what I like to call the dissolving edges. Now this is really particular for Crater because if you go to the hub and you walk to the edge of the hub, you'll find something really similar where the edge of the game world in the hub dissolves gradually in voxels into nothingness. And um, it uses a particular material for that. I've used a different material in this one, but what's quite cool about it is it plays into the narrative of Crater as, um, as a platform. So if you read the comics, you, you will learn a lot more about this, but essentially you're making a game in uh, a much larger game. And by using the dissolving technique, you're showing uh, your game has an awareness of this much larger game that exists around it. Uh, and it really nicely ties into to that. Um, it's also uh, using a couple of design principles that are worth bearing in mind when you're designing any kind of boundary. Uh, one of them is uh, affordance. So as you can see, uh, affordance is essentially designing the aesthetic of something to make it look like, uh, to make it look in the in a way that um, instructs the user what to do with it. So here, our affordance is essentially making it less and less passable. So we can totally jump onto these voxels, but they get less and less passable until essentially you're going to just be jumping into oblivion. Um, and so that affordance is telling is kind of a bar is a is a soft barrier for our player. The other design principle this is using is uh, the design principle of aesthetic usability. And so um, by making things look more aesthetic or more detailed or um, more interesting, uh, you're kind of drawing uh, the player's attention to that thing and, um, uh, and as, as making something look really good, makes people want to use it. Making something look less good or less appetizing will actually push them away from it. So. I might not even approach the edge and start jumping around on the blocks because I can see from here, oh, that's not somewhere I want to go, thanks to a couple of uh, simple design principles that might also apply. You can apply those principles in alternative ways, and I urge you to consider um, those two principles when you're thinking about your game boundaries. So the, 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 the game area here is lush and um, full of detail and, and rich in meshes and things like that, and then you can see the edge of the game world is is less so. And I'm using a particular voxel, which I only will use around the edge um, and telling the player, this is the edge of the game world. So I'm literally telling them through the visual language of the voxels, that's it, that's where you wanna go to, try and stay within that. And most players will look at that and be like, oh, that's cool, it blends into the creator universe and then pay no more mind to it and try and stay on the floating island. The cool thing, another cool thing about that is that you could add other floating islands to tell more of a story or a narrative, um, but you don't necessarily have to. In fact, you could lose the horizon completely and not even be thinking about that. And it still is a cool sort of space to, to hang out in and still looks um, relatively, relatively okay. So that's uh, using the dissolving boundaries technique. Uh, and we're really getting into now just approaches to soften up the boundaries so that it's not such a hard 2D plane uh, that you run into. And the next approach for that that I like is this. If you're making an urban environment, then you might want to approach it in this way. So this is what I like to call overlapping geometry. And the principle is that you overlap things on top of each other until the player can't see past a point. So... By, by doing this, you are building an almost like an enclosed space, but you're still telling the player a bit of story around it. It's a wall, but it's a soft wall uh, with many semi-transparent layers. Um, uh, and it's quite uh, an interesting approach uh, because it builds in that immersion. Um, it adds a little bit more uh, story to the to narrative and aesthetic to the game world. It looks more polished. It's very time, it can be very time consuming, um, but it starts, the way we make this is it starts beyond 
uh, at before the game boundary. So here I'm breaking up the game boundary, which is this chain link fence. I'm breaking that up with um, just putting things in front of it so that it's not so flat. So I'm adding depth before it, then I have the boundary, and then the other side of the boundary, again, I'm adding layers, but notice here, I'm adding the layers in higher and higher positions. If you look outside in the real world, where there aren't any boundaries, because it's a sphere, that at some point, your view of the horizon is blocked by something, unless you're looking out to sea. Uh, and so in a similar vein, these overlapping geometry are gradually blocking the view. So they need to increase in height until they're uh, as high as um, a player can stand and not be able to see over it. Uh, and you can add some detail to tell more of a story, like I've added some metal uh, voxels and metal uh, meshes so that I'm building that kind of urban environment. Okay, it's concrete and metal. Um, it gives a little bit of a, a time as well. So an urban environment could exist in medieval times. It could exist in the future, it could exist in the now. Um, and so by doing this, we're kind of telling the story of when is this? Where is this? What kind of urban environment? Uh, what kind of materials are being used to create it? So you can add a bit of narrative. You can break up that hard edge um, to your game boundary. Uh, and yeah, uh, you still are making a hard boundary that people can't walk past. And they're not going to be put off by that. They're, it's just it's just there. So uh, that's overlapping geometry and uh, and increasing the height is an important part of that. And finally, uh, it's very, very similar to the overlapping geometry. I've tried to think about how to approach this in a natural way. So if we look at this, this is um, this is the land of Fey. So this would be like some kind of fantasy game. But any kind of game where you're in a natural environment can use this approach. Uh, and the approach is to use a combination of of overlapping geometry, but in this case, the geometry is mountains, um, fog to gradually decrease the visibility of that overlapping geometry as it drifts off into the distance, which means that, yes, you can see a long way, but you're not expecting loads of detail the further away um, what you're looking at is. And even adding uh, a hard edge, like something like this river, uh, before you even get to that. So I can't necessarily look and find, you know, exactly how I've made it. Albeit, let's show you how I've made that. I've made it using layers of voxel mesh. And what's cool about this is I've actually used exactly the same voxel mesh for each one. So this is the voxel mesh, and it's the same voxel mesh for sections of this. And I've just overlapped it in different ways to make sure that there's um, not a very obvious repeating pattern. There is a repeating pattern, but nature is full of repeating patterns, so I can get away with it a little bit with artistic license. Uh, I've added another voxel mesh here, which is a direct uh, duplicate of that voxel mesh, but I've colored some of it with a snowy voxel uh, as it approaches higher. And then beyond that, I would probably also uh, add the mountains horizon, inner and outer horizon. So we can see if we're just looking in this direction, it's broken up that two-dimensional, this is the boundary in a really similar way to it did uh, the way it did in the urban environment, but it's doing it now with, with mountains. And you can add um, like architectural weenies, they're called basically big, bold mountains, specific buildings or whatever to kind of guide your player around so that they know which direction they're facing as a part of that environment. And that could be a really useful thing for guiding your players around your game space. Before uh, we continue, I just want to show you, um, if I climb up this beanstalk over here, something to bear in mind when you're using a combination of fog and layers of mountains is, again, the elevated position can be a difficult thing to handle with your boundary because they can see the edge of the map, they can see the layers of mountains, they can see how you've made it, and it kind of breaks immersion a little bit. Um, so just bear in mind when you've got uh, elevated positions, what that does to your boundaries. How, how does a player view the boundary from those positions? Um, and that's really everything I wanted to talk about with regards to game boundaries. Now, like I said, these are just a couple of possible solutions that you may find helpful in your game. 
you are it's completely up to you how you uh tackle this problem of the edge of your game world what it means in your game um and i really urge you to think about innovative innovative ways to use narrative and mechanic to explore the edges of your game uh game world um, and if you do come up with some cool ideas, make sure to uh, post them up in our Discord, discord.gg forward slash creator. Um, share your approach and learn from each other to, to, talk, about, uh, to talk about this stuff uh, and, and game boundaries. Uh, and hopefully this has been a useful and helpful tutorial. And I really look forward to seeing what you do with your game boundaries in Crater.